Hi folks, this is Jack Spirico with a survival podcast video. Really more of a real truth about money video, honestly. I'll probably feature it on that blog. Uh, but it's actually a video response to Living History Channel's uh, video that was called Red Alert, Please Watch. Well, he was really concerned about the fact that Tim Geithner uh, wrote a letter to, to uh, Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid basically saying, you guys got to raise the debt ceiling, and if you don't, the U.S. will begin defaulting on its debt. And uh, I made some comments there that were well received, I think, by Living History Channel, but some of the other commenters took exception to and made statements like, just let it fall, just let it collapse, it doesn't matter, fix it by replacing it with gold, make the currency private, all types of statements that I really believe that a lot of people making them today just don't understand. Uh, they don't get what they're asking for, they don't get the current system, they believe in myths that aren't even true about what's going on right now. I want to tell you a few things today that you may struggle with, you may object to, you may even get angry about, but I challenge you to research them for yourself and determine whether or not what I'm telling you is true. Uh, a couple myths that I want to I want to dispel today. One, that we can ever repay or significantly reduce the debt with the current system. Uh, that can't be done. You'll understand why when I'm done today. Uh, the next one is that we currently have a fiat currency. That This $10 bill, this US $10 Federal Reserve note is fiat. It is not fiat. Um, it's not good. It's actually worse than fiat. But how many times have you heard, you know, the gold bugs tell you this is a fiat currency and back in the old days that this would have been a gold or a silver certificate and that was real money and fiat's not real money. People don't really understand money. This is deeper than we're going to go today, but I want you to understand something. This is not money. If it was a silver certificate or a gold certificate, it's still not money. The money is actually the agreement between you and I to exchange it that makes it actually have value. Uh, but we'll let that go for today. But just understand, this is not fiat. And um, again, the debt cannot be repaid. And the debt ceiling will be raised. I'm not saying I want more debt. Nobody is more opposed to increasing our national debt than I am. But I'm telling you, under the current system, it is the only choice. No, these things will be hard to take. Let's start out with the first myth, myth that this is a fiat currency. If we're going to object to this form of currency, we actually have to know what it is, and we have to object to it uh, intelligently, and we have to come up with a viable replacement solution for it. And if we start out with stating it is something it in fact is not, there's absolutely no way that we're ever going to be successful with that. It starts with education. So how is this not a fiat currency? Uh, the gold bug will tell you since gold, silver, or some other commodity doesn't back it, it's fiat. But if it was a fiat currency, the United States government itself would issue this, this note and say this is 10 US dollars and it is backed by the full faith and credit of the American government and therefore since the government is a reflection of the people, the American people. And that would be a fiat currency. That has problems, no doubt, especially if it's not managed properly, but at least it comes without one thing, interest and debt. This is not a fiat currency, it is a debt-backed currency. This $10 bill, I'm going to use this knife as a prop, is backed by a bond issued by the government for debt plus interest. So, a fiat currency is issued directly by the government. Our currency is backed by debt. And if you don't understand that this is a debt-backed currency, not a fiat currency, it's really hard for the rest of any of this stuff to make sense. What is a true fiat currency? In the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln issued the greenback. It was a debt-free currency. And, and I'm not saying good, bad, or indifferent about it. What I'm saying is that was a true fiat currency. It was backed by the government, not by debt owed through a private institution of banks with government regulation, basically a fascist system. When government and corporations intermesh, that's what the Federal Reserve is. And, and that's what's backing this today, not the government itself. During the American Revolution, the Continental Congress issued currency called the Continental. That was a fiat currency. It was backed by the infant government of the Continental Congress and uh, the colonies that were now calling themselves, for the first time, states. Neither was backed by gold, nor were they backed by debt. They were issued by the governing authority. That's a fiat currency. Again, not bad, good, or indifferent. All I'm saying is, how many times have you heard the people trying to sell you an ounce of gold say this is fiat? And it is not. Debt backed. Now, on the debt ceiling, I have couple props here. I have a $1 bill, a $10 bill, and a knife that again represents a bond. For you to understand why the debt can't be repaid, you have to understand where the currency comes from and how the debt plays against it. Let's say the United States needs some new money. Now to keep this in perspective, we'll say it's $10, where it would probably be a billion dollars. 
but they need this ten dollars uh, to be created. And so the first step is the United States Treasury doesn't print the ten dollar bill. That would be fiat. It prints a bond for ten dollars. Again, this is really a billion dollars, but let's keep the numbers rather easy to understand. So it creates a bond, but the bond itself does nothing. So they say we want to sell the bonds, and we'll sell the bonds with an interest rate, and they put them up for auction. They don't set the interest rate. They put them out there and say, anybody that wants to can buy this bond. It can be the government of China. It can be a little old lady that wants to put it in a strong box. It can be Bank of America. It can be J.P. Morgan Chase. It can be the English. It can be the Chinese. It can be anybody can buy this bond. And there's lots of them out there. Man, we're just going to make a whole bunch of bonds and put them out there. Well, let's say in steps Bank of America. And Bank of America says, okay, we'll buy this bond for $10. And they take a $10 transaction over, and they give it to the Treasury. Now the Treasury has $10, and the bond goes to Bank of America. If this is where it stopped, it would be a legitimate debt, and a legitimate debt system, and a system whereby the government eventually could free itself from the debt, the bond, by paying it back with some interest. And everything would go back to the status quo. The problem is that's not how it actually works. And if you looked at it that way, no new money was created. There was, new, there was more debt, but there wasn't more money. Now, we have to have growth of the money supply in the current system as well. Why? Because whenever they loan the $10, it always is, always is due back with interest. So there must be more money in circulation than there is debt. Because this is the principal, and this is the interest, and principal and interest is always more than just the principal. Got it? So, how do we make new money? Bank of America, again, gave the federal government $10, I'm going to call them that, and got the bond. So they're sitting there holding the bond. Now, in steps the Federal Reserve, the people that actually make our money, that create new money, and they say to Bank of America, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll take that bond off your hand. We'll pay you the interest on it up to this point. We'll hold the bond till maturity, and we will become the receiver of the government's debt. And Bank of America says, fine. Uh, yeah, we'd like to divest ourselves of this bond. It's a five-year bond or a four-and-a-half-year bond. We've held it for a year. Give us one year's interest. We'll take that $10 or $1 million dollars or whatever it actually is. We'll put it into our banking system. That money gets magnified and multiplied there. Different video, we'll have to go into that. Now, you would think that the Federal Reserve takes $10, gives it to Bank of America, and takes the bond, plus a little bit of interest. But it's not how it works at all. What happens is somebody at the Federal Reserve takes a computer like this one right here, sits down, types a journal entry, deposit to Bank of America $1 million or $10 or billion or whatever the bond value is, and a little bit of interest added onto it, hits enter, done. Now, the thing is, they didn't use money to buy that. They've actually created a brand new $10. And that's now in the banking system, and it gets loaned out to you, and it gets used in the banking system, however that is. We now owe the Fed the $10 plus the interest. But where does the interest come from? The interest comes from doing this over and over, because every time we need more money, Every time we need more money in the system, because there's more people, there's more output, there's more things to buy, the economy grows. Every time we need more money, the only way we get money to increase in volume in this country is through debt. The banks do it when you buy a house. Again, I don't want to go too deep into this, but when you buy a house and they give you $100,000 to buy a house, they don't actually give you $100,000. They do the same thing the Fed does. They make a journal entry. And you owe them the money back plus interest. But the Fed is doing this at the national level. What does that mean? That means a couple things. It means, one, we can never repay the debt. okay? Because if we want to repay the $10 in debt, and we give that to the Fed or whoever we owe the money to, because let's say the Fed hasn't monetized it yet, but say the Chinese are holding it or the English are holding it or whoever, we need the principal plus the interest. But the interest is created by the same process. This is a, a certificate for $1 of debt plus interest. This is a certificate for $10 of debt plus interest. So if we took all the money that exists, and in paper money, folks, only 3% of our money exists as paper. All the other 97% is inside a computer. But if we took all the computer money and all the paper money and we put it in a giant pile, and I mean everybody's money, 
Bill Gates' money, Warren Buffett's money, the billionaire, the trillionaire, everybody's money, down to the little old lady and took the pennies out of her jar. And we put all the money into one big pile. And we went to the Federal Reserve and we went to our debtors' nations and said we want to buy our freedom. We want the debt paid off. There wouldn't be enough money there to pay the debt. We would need interest. And how would we get it? We would issue a bond that would go to the Federal Reserve that would create the new currency, and the new currency would be debt. The real trap in this system, the currency must grow. The economy must grow. It is growth at all costs. That is why since 1913, no matter who's been in power as a president, no matter who's been in power as a Congress, the money supply has grown, and the debt has grown, and the interest on the debt has grown. I'm going to tell you something right now that you might not be aware of. The interest on our debt, the interest on our debt in this budget year is larger than every other single department of government other than Social Security, Medicaid, and the Department of Defense. Those are the only three organizations that cost more than the interest on our money. That's how this works. And that's why, that's why the debt ceiling will be raised. That's why whether your congressman or senator votes for it or opposes it, it doesn't matter. It's going to happen because it mathematically must happen. The only way we can change the debt, the only way we can actually reduce the debt, the only way we can make any impact on it, we have to change the system. The system is the problem. And when you say, well, we'll just back it with gold, that doesn't fix the problem unless we get rid of fractional reserve banking and a Federal Reserve. Those of you that say, let's privatize everything. Let's let the banks compete. Banks compete for what? A profit. They don't do it to be the most popular bank. This isn't a clique. This isn't a fraternity or a sorority. It's about profit. The banks created this system. And they do this in consort with government, which is terrible, but at least there's some oversight and some limitation. We are now putting this debt into the, into the hands of our children. Our children are going to have to pay this. Our grandchildren. We are putting our children literally into the hands of the demons when we do this. If you take the government out and you just let the private banks that created this system in the first place run it, we're putting our children into the hands of Satan himself. A, a competing currency means no U.S. dollar. Our money, with our nation's name on it, is what our national sovereignty is based on. Our revolution, folks, our American revolution wasn't fought over taxes per se. It was fought over what the taxes had to be paid in. They had to be paid in debt-backed English currency, backed by gold, but also carrying debt and interest. Our colonies created their own currencies that were free of interest in debt, and the English with the Stamp Act stamped that out. That's what stamp really means. They meant a stamp, but they stomped on it. And they put that down. That's what the colonies really revolted for. And this is what we have now. doesn't matter whether it's backed by gold or it's backed by thin air. The point is the currency carries interest. That's where we're at. If you'd like to know more, if you'd like to really understand this at a deeper level, uh, I'd like to give you some resources. One is right here on YouTube. You can watch a program by a guy named Chris Martinson called The Crash Course. He will explain the money creation system and resource limitations as well. He'll explain how the banks play the same game. I have a website called The Real Truth About Money. It is located at trtam.com. And on that website, there is a free book you can download. It's still in beta version. There might be a few little uh, clerical errors that need to be cleaned up. But it will explain this to you in so much more depth. And it will explain why we can't just fix it with gold. We can't just fix it with silver. And folks, I'm a huge advocate of gold and silver. I think you should own them. I think they should be in your possession. I think they're a great hedge against inflation. And I think whatever money system that we replace the current system with, gold and silver play a part in it, not the only part, but a part in it uh, to make it right. But if you go to The Real Truth About Money, you can read my blog and you can read my book. It is a free download uh, as far as the book goes. 
And there's one more resource that I want you to check out. There's a series of videos on here by a gentleman that I actually believe is a Canadian that explains why the United States is no longer a republic but a financial empire and explains this monetary system in greater depth. You'll find links to all of those things in the video notes that uh, accompany this video. I welcome your video responses. I welcome your comments. But please don't be hateful and angry with me. I'm explaining to you how the system works. These things are not my opinion. Uh, a few of them are, but most of what I've told you today is simple fact. And those of you that are saying just on that on the, on the living history uh, uh, living histories of channel on his video, just saying let it collapse, let it collapse, let it fall apart. I don't think most of you know what you're asking for. Let me tell you the truth: if our economy collapses, I'm prepared for it. That's what I do. Uh, that, I do a show about it every day called the Survival Podcast, and, and I am prepared for whatever comes our way. Trust me, I'm very prepared. Most of you that are calling for it, you don't know what you're calling for, and you're not prepared at all. You know, if you have a couple months worth of food and you think and, and a gun with some bullets, that's not being prepared. You have to be prepared for a much longer duration than that. And you have to be emotionally and mentally and spiritually prepared. And I think a lot of you guys that are saying, oh, I'll just let it fall. You don't know what you're talking about. You don't know how many old people are going to starve to death. You don't know how many people on the welfare dole won't get their welfare check. And you might think, oh, the heck with that. Let them stop. I don't care. Well, you will when they start rioting in the streets. When they start tearing the society apart. Half of our society today works directly for one form or another of government. As soon as the government begins to default, those jobs dry up and go away. What you're talking about when you say let it collapse is a complete and total economic collapse of this country. I would prefer that we come together as a people and we realize the slavery that we're under and we replace it with something better. Uh, that could have a gold or silver standard attached to it in some shape or form or another. That's for us to debate. But what we have to do is we have to get rid of a system where all of our currency is backed by a bond and therefore debt and where our nation is literally in hock to a group of private bankers that we call the Federal Reserve. The folks, they're about as federal as Federal Express.